again. It's over. He's done it again. Unbelievable. Oh, oh straight into the roof of the net. Nice one. Straight down the middle. So a good performance from both teams here today. Hello and welcome to First Sports. I'm Rupa Ramani. Let's get started. A legacy is a very key component that defines sport. Every sporting team, company, franchise or club dreams of leaving a rich legacy behind them. It's that dream of putting down a template that your successors will try to replicate and keep renewing. Like former India cricketer MS Dhoni and his Chennai Super Kings legacy. It's a rich one that is being handed over this season. But what is the magic potion to his success? And speaking of one man's vision and success, what has made a side that finished 17th at the Bundesliga in 2022, now league champions two years later? The answer is their manager, Zabi Alonso. What has he done and how has he created such a historic turnaround in fortunes? We'll tell you more on that. And on a slightly different note, Nike is facing the heat after their launch of the USA team's attire for the women athletes at the Olympics. Criticisms say it's too skimpy and revealing. But first, Sports 360. We'll start with football. The Premier League title race has now shifted in Manchester City's favour after Arsenal lost to Aston Villa and Liverpool were beaten by Crystal Palace. Manchester City moves to the top spot with 73 points. The Gunners are now two points behind tabletoppers Manchester City and Liverpool with 71 are placed third. Over in Serie A, the Roma's game against Udinese was abandoned after Roma player Ivan Dika collapsed on the ground. The defender fell on the pitch in the 70th minute and was taken to the hospital. The score was at one all. When the player collapsed, the game was suspended following this incident. In tennis, Stefano Tsitsipa has clinched the Monte Carlo Masters for the third time. He crushed eight-seeded Kasper Rud, 6-1, 6-4 in the final. Rud had reached the final, beating Novak Djokovic in the semis. Tsitsipa is now the first player in the professional era to win his first three Monte Carlo finals in straight sets. Over in golf, world number one Scotty Scheffler won the Masters tournament at Augusta. This was Scheffler's second master, Masters title in three years. Ludwig Eiberg finished second on his major debut, whereas Tiger Woods finished at the bottom. Over in the UFC, Conor McGregor's long-awaited return to the cage is now official. He will fight Michael Chandler at UFC 303 in Las Vegas on the 29th of June. McGregor is a former two-division champion and has not fought ever since July 2021, where he broke his leg in the fight against Dustin Poirier. And over in chess, India's Vidit Gujarati beat world number three Hikaru Nakamura in round nine of the candidates' chess tournament, while D. Kukesh Pragyananda played out a draw. Kukesh now is at the top of the table with Ian Nevomnyachi. Pragyananda is just half a point behind the table toppers. Culture is a super crucial facet of any sporting team. It's the legacy that is passed down to generations. It's usually the vision of their biggest leader. We've seen this across legendary sporting teams, clubs, franchises. A vision that defines the way they play. The secret to their success, like that magic potion. When it comes to the IPL and the Chennai franchise, that secret potion maker is MS Dhoni. A potion he concocted when he took charge decades ago in 2008 and one that stands even today, under a different leader and different scenario. Chennai took on Mumbai in a ground that was not their home, but the chants of Dhoni and CSK were loud and deafening, made you wonder which city you were really in. But that comes with the MS Dhoni aura. Plus, there is still that generic wave of dissent towards Mumbai at this point. We could sense it even last night. But talking of Chennai versus Mumbai, it's the biggest clash in IPL. This fixture dictates TRPs, views, ticket sales and all the surround sound. It's the biggest fight in the league. And that's because of the legacy that two leaders, MS Dhoni and Rohit Sharma, have established over the years that they were in charge. And at the end of the night, it became that, Rohit versus Dhoni. Rohit's century, not an easy feat in IPL, ending up falling short. 
Dhoni's 20 runs and four deliveries became more critical. The differentiator really as Mumbai lost the match by 20 runs. The 20 runs that MS Dhoni entertained his fans with. Three massive sixes that sent the whole stadium into frenzy. And if that was not enough, after the last ball, he runs all the way up to the pavilion. And while he strides up the stairs, he comes across a cricket ball that most probably would have struck, would have been struck by him. And he picks that up and hands it over to one young fan across the fence, who was probably more stunned than anyone, but gladly took it. The symbolic gesture by the man who struck the winning runs that helped India to a World Cup win in 2011 was not lost on anyone there and the commentators as well. The crowd, of course, went crazy watching this magical moment transpire. The loudest cheers, the biggest screams reserved for this one man. And that's the legacy that follows MSD everywhere Chennai goes. And it's that MSD legacy that permeates the team. A team where every player will do just about anything for him. Where young bowlers like Thushar Deshpande and Matisha Patirana will breathe fire and be the most disciplined to put Mumbai on the mat. Bowling the most troubling line and length to trap the opposition batters. Where a young, very jaded southpaw, Shivam Dubey, struggling with his form, the shot deliveries, and woefully out of form, becomes the biggest six-hitting machine in their camp. Where Mustafizur, not known for his agil agility when it comes to fielding, pouches a cool catch and stunningly holds onto it on the ropes to dismiss the most dangerous batter in Mumbai, Surya Kumar Yadav, for a duck. Where Shardul Thakur, known to leak runs in the past, bowls a magical 15th over to create the pressure that led to the eventual strangulation of the Mumbai outfit. They do it for MS Dhoni's vision. Everything and everyone revolves around him. Why else would a new captain, when asked what was the most heartening thing about that win, talk about a young wicketkeeper blasting three sixes at the back and to get the total to 2 not 7 We have to speak about Mumbai too. They wouldn't be too happy with the way, they wouldn't be too unhappy with the manner in which they lost. They did come close, but the loss and to Chennai, the arch rivals will surely hurt. That picture of Rohit Sharma walking off desolate at the end of the game spoke a million words. And that of Hardik Pandya, sitting there along the ropes next to Kyron Pollard, who at the post-match press conference told everyone to stop nitpicking Hardik, the captain, is surely disheartening. The boos are not stopping and is only getting more cruel now because that is clearly playing on Hardik Pandya's mind. You are human and it is bound to take a toll as it is far down the road now. The result is Hardik underperforming, not giving his best. The crowd celebrating Hardik being tonked in that last over ought to hurt. And by result of his performance getting hit, it's not just hurting the chances of Mumbai Indians in this league as a franchise, but also India because a World Cup is coming. It is around the corner, right after the IPL. And India needs Hardik Pandya, the match winner performing at his best. Even though, like they say, it's a long tournament, a turnaround has to happen, could be around the corner, but it has to happen now. We're talking of legacy in sport and passing down that legacy of the vision being handed over to the next in line. And although this is difficult to execute, because adopting, buying into and propagating one person's vision as your own is often hard. You have to do it with conviction. But guess what's more difficult? Creating a legacy from scratch. Being the first person to establish a winning pattern that will be remembered for generations to come. Because let's face it, an underdog story is far more enriching and interesting narrative than watching a team build on years of legacy by conquering yet another feat. Because success for the established isn't half as fascinating as the triumph of an underdog. A statement that perfectly describes German football today. By Leverkusen scored five goals against Werden in another Bundesliga outing, adding another win to their undefeated season. But this win was sweeter because of this, they lifted the Bundesliga title, their first league title in the history of German football. And it couldn't have come at a better time. They were playing at home in front of a stadium packed to the brim with fans giving them just about everything to cheer about. Not just the stadium, but the whole city of Leverkusen erupted with joy. And it was because of one man. The one man who gave the people of Leverkusen their biggest triumph. Zabi Alonso, the Spaniard who himself won multiple Bundesliga titles as a Bayern Munich player. 
ended Munich's 11-year dominance in the Bundesliga and gave Leverkusen their first title in 120 years. Yeah, only to, to sagen. Finally, we can say Bayer Leverkusen is a German champion. It's a huge honour for all of us. It was totally earned by the team, by the club, by the fans. Everyone, all departments were working and fighting for this title, so we are a result of that hard work over many years. This is a moment to enjoy and a huge success for this club. The first title is always special for everyone. So to be part of this history feels incredible. But why is this win so special? It is not just because it was Leverkusen's first title, that's huge. But it's the way Leverkusen secured the victory. There are still five games left in the season and despite that, there is a champion. Leverkusen are 16 points ahead of Bayern Munich and in five games, Munich can only aggregate 15 points, which made Leverkusen champion even before the final day. A dominance that's usually shown by Bayern Munich in the German league. So Leverkusen not just ended Bayern's supremacy, but the club also started a bit of their own authority in Bundesliga. So how did this come about? Here was a club that had languished in the 17th position at this very stage, just two years ago. The person at the centre of this miracle campaign has been their manager. Xabi Alonso took over the role of Leverkusen's manager in 2022, a time when the club was in the relegation zone. And when you are there at the bottom three and fail to improve your standings, the eventuality is that the club could find itself demoted to the lower divisions of German football. That was the scenario when Xabi Alonso took charge, when he took over. And in just more than a year and a half, Alonso changed the whole facade of Leverkusen. First, he made sure they got out of relegation zone. That was imperative and the first task at hand. And then began the rebuilding phase, a side, rebuilding a side that was clearly in tatters at that point. Xabi Alonso's principle was simple. He built a strategy without resorting to splurging cash or roping in the expensive players. Alonso targeted the basics, the basic foundation of any club, any team, any sporting group. He concentrated on changing the work culture and the team ethics. His focus was not just on bettering their goal-scoring skills, that's important, but also on the all-round play, how well they defended, how well they kept opponents in check. And that is what everyone started seeing in the new and slowly revamping Leverkusen. In a season where Bayern Munich's Harry Kane has scored 32 goals. Leverkusen's highest scorer has been Florian Watts and Victor Boniface with 11 goals apiece. So you do not need the big numbers to win big. He gave Victor Boniface more freedom to play. Alonso pushed the player to take more chances, take more risks, which improved the conversion rate too, giving Boniface the freedom to play with no hesitation. Greater the risk, greater the rewards. That automatically improved his game too and made him a better player. No wonder Jurgen Klopp, who's a strong tactician himself, called Alonso a standout manager. And it's not like Leverkusen was a poor club all these years, I'm not getting there. They always came close to winning trophies but couldn't really get over the line. A line that sat far away from them for 120 years. They had a nickname, Visekusen, which means second cousin in English, never first. They had the tag of finishing second, being the bridesmaid always. Up until 2011, Leverkusen finished second on five occasions. It took Alonso's magical touch to make them the champions they are today. I knew quite a lot because uh, Leverkusen is no new. It's, it's, it has been a, a great club for, for years with so many great players, with so many great uh, uh, coaches. I had played here a few, few times. So, uh, yeah, I have no doubt that it could be a, a great, great step in my you know, new career because it was my first station as a, as a coach. And last year uh, helped me a lot and to, to came in a difficult situation to prove so many things. It was a great first experience, hoping that the second year would be better, not expecting that good, but happy to live that good. It's an achievement that is nothing short of a miracle, but that isn't the only piece of historical glory that the club is chasing. Leverkusen has now been unbeaten, is remain unbeaten in 43 consecutive matches across all competitions. The longest streak by any German club across tournaments. In the 29 matches in Bundesliga alone, they've won 25 games and have drawn four. 
and with five more games left in the season, the possibility is definitely overwhelming and one that they would be doing their best not to let their minds wander to that often. But the possibilities don't end here. Leverkusen will be eyeing for another historic achievement. Having won the Bundesliga title, Leverkusen with the Europa League quarterfinals coming up and the DFB Pokal final, Germany's domestic tournament, are in contention of a super triumph. Meaning in the year of their maiden Bundesliga win, they are also on the verge of claiming a treble. And it's the one person who has made it possible so far, Zabi Alonso, a dependable midfielder in his own playing days, is harnessing those very qualities now as a manager, acting as a playmaker for Leverkusen and also blocking others from winning trophies. All of that without even taking the field. The same Alonso who turned down the lucrative offer to coach Liverpool is now spinning magic at a club that clearly has their faith in his abilities. So, he has some unfinished business yet at Leverkusen and Alonso, just as you heard him, is not done with one trophy alone. This story is about a controversy. It doesn't come from a decision taken on the field or a fight that broke off between players. No, this is to do with sportswear. Just some weeks back, we spoke about Adidas and the German Football Association coming under fire for their ill-thought-through jersey design that created quite a stir. Well, now it's Nike that's caught in the crossfire for their design of Team USA's Olympics kit, particularly for the women athletes. Nike is facing the heat for its kit designed for Team USA's track and field athletes. Critics have called the design sexist and too skimpy for comfort. Was the design really that controversial and what's going to happen next? A report. It's been close to 125 years since women first took part in the Olympics. The long period has seen major transitions in various aspects, from being restricted to participation in only certain disciplines to the clothes women athletes would wear. The evolution has been significant. Back in the 1900s, women were told to wear ankle-length dresses with long sleeves and high necklines. Now though, apparel which is more comfortable to work in is freely being used. The 21st century saw a remarkable change in women athletes' gear. But a new launch for Team USA's women line has received severe backlash for being too skimpy and revealing. Nike revealed the women's kit for USA's track and field athletes for the Paris Olympics. The launch had a model wearing a very racy high-cut panty line with a sports bra. Athletes the world over have expressed their concerns over the liberal design. Athletes have called the design sexist and criticized Nike for prioritizing skimpiness over comfort. It also caught the eye of former athletes who called out Nike for its design. I'm sorry, but show me one WNBA or NWSL team who would enthusiastically support this kit. This is for Olympic track and field. Professional athletes should be able to compete without dedicating brain space to constant pube vigilance or the mental gymnastics of having every vulnerable piece of your body on display. Women's kits should be in service to performance mentally and physically. If this outfit was truly beneficial to physical performance, men would wear it. This is not an elite athletic kit for track and field. Nike, however, claims the dress is suitable for sporting performance. The sportswear brand has even claimed it took inputs from athletes before designing it this way. They even added that athletes have an option of choosing between a pair of shorts or a brief. But despite Nike's clarification, the controversy doesn't seem to end. This isn't the first time a kit is under the scanner for being too revealing. For years now, the debate has raged over more revealing outfits for female Olympians. Sports organizations have faced backlash for their strict rules regarding their women's kit especially in sports like beach volleyball and gymnastics, where women are only given the option of wearing bikini bottoms while their male counterparts wear shorts. In the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, Germany's women's gymnastics team wore full-length bodysuits instead of short leotards. The move was to take a stand against sexualization in the sport. While Germany's decision was deemed as an athlete's choice, in another instance, in 2021, Norway's women's beach handball team were punished when they decided to wear shorts during a European Championship match against Spain. 
the Norwegian team was fined $1,390 for their act of defiance. Women's apparel, along with the thought behind it, has changed over the decades. They were made to wear full-length clothes initially, which heavily restricted their movements. Almost a decade later, at the 1908 Olympics in London, women were allowed to wear skirts, which was seen as a marked improvement. And in the coming years, the evolution continued. Women athletes weren't just restricted to a few sports, and their participation in swimming saw more relaxed attires. From long skirts to bikini bottoms being the rule, women's apparel in sports has come a long way. But back to Nike's racy kit. There are some voices that don't really have any objections either. Pole vaulter Katie Moon said the kit wasn't as revealing as she expected. I tried on the same style today and didn't feel worried about things popping out. I think it's just the mannequin. And a few of the athletes were seen wearing the various options during the launch. Runner Ating Mu wore briefs and sprinter Shikari Richardson wore shorts. So the jury is still out on sportswear for women. In an additional update, we hear tailors are going to be made available during the games. I guess a stitch in time can save USA a podium finish. Time for last serve. Now we take you to Switzerland to the icy slopes where the world's best skiers and snowboarders are breaking multiple world records and doing so with some stunning maneuvers on the slopes. Take a look. That wraps up the first sports here. Thanks for joining in. I'll see you again tomorrow. Till then, take care.